Welcome to my Webflow Conf recap here on this Formbook channel. My name is Jonas Arlet and today I walk you through the top highlights from Webflow Conf 25. Sure, there are already a few recap videos here on YouTube, but in this one I don't just want to list all the features and updates. I want to give you examples and insights so you actually understand what you can do with these updates now and what they really mean for you and for Webflow going forward. Let's dive right into the biggest topic, AI. It was clear right from the start that Webflow really pushed this direction during the conference. AI is now much more integrated in the core product and it was presented in a way to impress especially marketers and enterprise customers. But honestly, for me, it sometimes felt a bit too much like, let's say, password bingo. The speakers loaded their intros with words like bold design, AI, next gen, personalized scale and so on. And at times it felt scripted and artificial and didn't add much value. I would have preferred if they had gotten to the real useful updates faster instead of circling around with big phrases. And that's why I decided to structure this recap here now in my own order, starting with the updates that I think bring the most value to myself. And the first topic is AI. Uh, also Webflow kicked off uh, with AI and I also see this as the biggest area of value in the future. Not necessarily uh, the way that they presented it on stage, but more when you think a step further. The AI assistant has been completely overhauled. Soon you'll be able to activate it directly from a toggle in the designer navigation. And personally, I thought the use case they showed first was pretty weak compared to what followed. They demonstrated creating a new section with AI. But the far more exciting part is that it seems like the assistant now understands your entire site structure, your styles, your variables and your CMS. And that's, I think, is, is huge. The old assistant never really adapted to my personal workflow. And if this new version truly understands how I work, the naming conventions I use and how I structure elements, then it gets really interesting. In the live demo, you could see how risky AI demos can be. The result was rather meh and uh, the audience wasn't blown away either. But the core idea is solid, working faster while still keeping control of your design. And the new AI assist assistant is set to roll out later this year. But for me, the real value is not in letting AI build new feature sections. I actually enjoy doing that myself. The assistant should help me with the boring stuff like time-consuming tasks, generating alt texts, writing meta descriptions or creating schema markup for SEO. And that's exactly what it can do now. In the audit panel, you can now step through each page while Webflow AI scans your content and then recommends optimizations. This is, I think, super useful. And there's also a new field coming in the page settings where you can automatically generate schema markup. And this is especially important for something called answer engine optimization, AEO, a term I hadn't heard before, but AEO basically means optimi optimizing your content so it shows up not only in search engines, but also in AI-driven platforms like ChatGPT, Microsoft Copilot or Google AI and so on. And until now, Many people manually added schema code themselves. And having this built now into Webflow saves a ton of time. And then there was another update to the um, access via the MCP server, which now includes Webflow designer functions. That means that developers can directly interact with projects, update CMS content, rename assets, or even rebuild entire sections. And what's now new for all of us here that don't want to use the MCP server is that you can basically now also trigger all this um, functionality inside of the designer um, through the AI assistant. But when it comes to AI, I think it is most valuable for me when it helps me build things I couldn't code myself. But the back and forth of copy paste from an AI chat into Webflow has always been a pain to me at least, but that's now happening more and more natively inside Webflow. You can literally create 
full web apps from a single prompt running on Webflow Cloud. And Webflow showed an example here with an interactive calendar, a full year calendar with a detail page and the option to add events to Google Calendar. And these are exactly the kinds of features that as an agency you couldn't just casually offer before. Now you can uh, build them directly in Webflow as a one-person pe show and that means real added value for your clients and new revenue opportunities for you. And under the hood this all runs on Astro, a framework that's become very popular in the developer community. According to Astro's official blog, Webflow donated $150,000 to support the open source project and is now an official partner. The AI assistant in Webflow can also generate React components that you can visually edit inside of the designer and then store as a code component. And if this is coming, this will be really, really interesting. But let's wait and see um, how we can customize these uh, components then and how this all works in practice. These AI features are scheduled to roll out early um, next year, I think, with an early access available now. And now I want to give you some examples of what you can build with code components or web apps in Webflow in the future. For example, a location finder with map and filter possibilities. Like AI builds you a search bar, a geo lookup with um, an open source, uh, street maps for example, and map pins and opening hours, and all powered by the CMS data. For clients with multiple locations, this can be a huge value, fully in the Webflow look and feel. A next example could be dynamic charts and dashboards. A bar or a line chart pulling live data from the CMS. And this is perfect for storytelling with that data directly on your site without external embeds. Or a product configurator as a React component. For example, variants like color or size or live pricing or image switching, all in a reusable component. You could also add a checkout, for example, via Stripe, as I show you in my Webflow expert course. Then you could build a multi-step form with logic. For example, input fields, progress indicators, validation, and a clean CRM handoff. Features that really improve conversion rates. Or a job board with application flow, listing and detail pages. Or the AI can help you code a booking system for rentals or accommodations. The next topic is the next gen CMS. And this is for me the might actually be the most important announcement after the AI because the CMS is the foundation of pretty much every site I built. And Webflow has rebuilt the CMS from the ground up and the goal was more flexibility, more scalability and a better performance, especially for larger projects. And until now the CMS was often the bottleneck as projects grew. Large data sets, complex relations or nested structures often slowed everything down or hurt the designer experience. And also long standing frustrations like nested collection limits were always an issue. And they bring some key improvements. For example, to enterprise sites, they can now scale up to 1 million CMS items. They also double the fields per collection and double the reference fields in the CMS. But they also bring more flexibility for all of us because you can then now um, add up to 40 collection lists per page and also up to 10 nested lists per page and up to 100 items per nested list, if I understand this correctly. Plus multi-level nesting up to three levels deep. I don't have a use case for that right, right now, but um, this was not possible in Webflow before. And also publishing backups and restores are now much faster and more stable, even on very large projects. That's at least what they tell us. And the new content delivery APIs will be now available to all users, meaning you can serve the CMS content, not only on your Webflow site, but also headlessly in apps, landing pages or other platforms. And I want to give you some examples and use cases for that, because I think this is also an interesting part, because you can, for example, use CMS content 
powering screens in a local store for or trade shows or in offices. You could also make product updates in a shop instantly pushed to digital displays as soon as they change in the Webflow CMS. Or you can make a multi-site publishing. So one content set is then served across multiple websites or microsites. And that's also something um, many clients have asked me how to do this. And my take on this um, CMS updates is that Webflow had already promised at the conf in 25, I think, uh, that the CMS limits and also the nested collection limits would be lifted by the end of the year. But honestly, not much uh, had happened. My guess is they realized they needed to rebuild the CMS completely to do it right. And that's exactly what they did now. It will also be interesting to see if Webflow eventually does the same thing with the Webflow designer. So moving away from an older structure and maybe building a fully modern new version of the Webflow designer. And for me personally, this is huge because I use the CMS in almost every project. And I think it's great that Webflow tackled the CMS here. And what I did miss though is that they talked a lot about the new limits and scaling, but didn't really show what it looks like in the designer or how what it what what will change. Other new fields, for example, or new query options, no filter possibilities better ways to build with data. That's what I was hoping for, but we didn't see anything like that. But still, this is a massive step forward for agencies and also business owners. It means larger, more complex multi-channel projects, and they are now realistic in Webflow, and the rollout is planned for later this year. Let's go to topic number three. That was, for me, the component canvas. Until now, you could only edit components by replacing um, uh, content inside on a sub page and tweak them there. Now you get a dedicated canvas similar to Figma or Framer where you can see different component variants side by side and then you can edit them independently from any other page. And for design systems, this is huge. It gives you a much better overview and lets you focus on refining a component without distractions. And personally, I used to hack around this by creating a hidden page in my Webflow project where I'd place all my components just uh, to keep them organized and easier to edit. Even hidden navigation elements were easier that way to, to edit. But with the component canvas, this workflow is finally built right into Webflow and I'm really looking forward to, um, to this. Topic number four is the GZIP interactions. This is an area I was really <laughs> excited about because I've been working a lot with the interactions and GZIP animations in the past months. And I was pretty surprised that Webflow even featured one of my latest projects during the conference. Because this is my Nova Mars project that was a really cool moment for me seeing my work showcased on such a big stage. And if you like to check it out or even clone it for free, the link is in the description. You can also follow along all the tutorials of this project here on this channel. But now what's new with GZAP? Uh, Webflow announced breakpoint specific animations, meaning you can show different animations on mobile versus desktop. And finally, true device specific control. So they also added more granular options to exclude animations. For example, if you set all images on a page to fade in, you can now exclude certain pages entirely. And this is super handy if you have some cleaner pages without without uh, motion. And another big one is accessibility because Webflow now respects system settings like reduced motion. So if users prefer fewer animations, Webflow will automatically disable them. And GZAP already supported this natively, but now you can configure it directly in the interactions panel. And all of this makes it more appealing for uh, developers to use Webflow's visual interface for animations instead of writing custom GZAP code because uh, yeah, complex scroll animations and interactions can now be built faster visually and also without writing any code. And as a bonus, Webflow announced an upcoming Lottie Files integration for even more advanced animations uh, later this year. Topic number five is real-time collaboration. 
Until now, only one person could actively work in the designer. And if someone else tried to join, they get a message like the designer is currently occupied. And that was a huge a bottleneck for teams. And with this update, multiple people can now work in Webflow simultaneously in true real time. Just like in Google Docs, for example, you can collaborate with teammates or clients editing pages, content and layouts all together. That means no more handovers, no waiting and fewer messy feedback loops. For agencies and bigger teams, this is certainly a massive productivity boost. It's currently in private beta, but is expected to roll out to all customers later this year. And by the way, I watched the event together with some folks from the German Webflow community in Berlin, and a few had already tested the feature and said it works surprisingly well, and they had eight people in the same project without any issues. The only downside is you can't um, yet see each other's cursor like you can for example, uh, see in, in Figma. And topic number six is comment only links. And this is another very practical update because until now clients or stakeholders needed a Webflow account to leave feedback directly in a project. And for many, that was a problem. And in the end, feedback often came uh, back as a screenshot via email, for example. And now you can simply send a comment only link and anyone with the link can open the site and leave comments directly and no login is required. And this saves a ton of time and makes collaboration with clients much smoother. And feedback lands then exactly where it belongs, right on the design. And this feature is rolling out also later this year. Then we got some form updates. You can now figure um, notifications per form individually. So each form can have its own recipients and notification emails. And this is super helpful when you have multiple forms on a site like contact, newsletter, um, signups and so on. And there's also a new spam inbox. So if you have some spam, it's landing the, there and you can review, restore or delete them. And that gives you much more control over your form data. Topic number eight is Webflow Analyze. Previously, you could already see clicks and scroll behavior directly in the designer, but now you, you also get uh, goal tracking and conversion goals and you can measure them right inside uh, Webflow. And they also added something new. You can now track how much traffic is coming from AI platforms like ChatGPT, Claude or Perplexity. And for the first time, you get actual insights into how these channels affect your site's traffic. And personally, I still think Webflow Analyze would benefit from a free simplified version uh, as, a, as a plan, just so more customers can see how valuable these analytics are right inside the project. Uh, but let's see how it evolves. So those were the key updates from the Webflow Conf 25, at least for me. Let me know in the comments which features do you find most exciting and do you already have ideas for how you will be using it in your projects. Thank you.